Welcome to the Payroll Podcast with your host, Nick Day. Find out what it takes to truly discover what it takes to elevate your career within payroll as we meet with the industry leaders who are shaping the industry for tomorrow. Hello, welcome back to Payroll Question Time. You've had a summer off. We've got loads to get through. And of course, National Payroll Week celebrations coming to a close. Just to let everybody know, National Payroll Week was established in the UK by the CIPP and it started back in 1998 and it was to celebrate the payroll profession. Just to give you an overview, I should have maybe just made that clear. That is, I mean, it's been going from 1998 by the professional body to encourage its members and anybody who has part of a payroll job to be involved and to realise it is an important career and a job that you do every day of the week. Thanks, Nick. I was going to say, it's been obviously recognised by the government as well this week, Nick, because so many announcements have come out. Indeed. Well, we'll get to those. Let's get into the nitty gritty then. Before we get into the latest announcements, let's see what's changed over the summer. First question already. So thank you for those watching this. Please keep the questions coming. Comes in for Jackie Thompson. It said, there's a random question on new starter checklists. So, does the panel agree it is more confusing than ever on the student loan questions? Do you th- and do you think HMRC will change the form again in April? So I'll, that, I'll start with that question and we'll jump into uh, some of these subjects. Mark. Simon, you're laughing. I'll come to you for that. Uh, many years ago, I turned up for a meeting in uh, 100 Parliament Street and they uh, explained to us that it was really complicated and very expensive to change this new starter checklist. And so I actually knocked one up in the corner of a room on my PC and posted it to them. <laughs> Uh, by our email uh, and said, you don't need to now, do you? Here's one. Uh, it did actually change at that point. No, the double questions on the student loan on the starter checklist are because it's a double negative question. So in effect, you're asked to say something doesn't apply and then not answer and how do you complete? I don't think there is an intention that the government will change it, to be honest. I think HMRC are happy with their design as it is but I agree it is very confusing. But it is better. I would argue it is better than the one we had before. I mean, what I would like to add there um, is what what still remains confusing with the starter checklist is whilst there are certain elements of gov.uk guidance make clear that it isn't the P46, which would, the, you know, the tax code side of it, those, those declarations relating to the tax code, you know, formally referred to the P46, and so there are elements of guidance that makes clear that this is not the P46. What is not always clear in the guidance across gov.uk is how important the starter checklist is, regardless as to whether or not you have a P45. Um, and I think that sometimes that message can be extremely confusing. The guidance is still almost written as if, well, if you haven't got a P45, use a starter checklist. But actually, um, you know, just touching on the student loan issue, there, there's quite a number of reasons why you would need both in all instances. So it, I, I think that would be my issue with the starter checklist. And I would agree with Simon, whilst it's not perfect, it's getting better. So, you know, we can, we can only hope that it will be perfect by the time the P45 is abolished. Uh, I actually did send them through a design which had one question in relation to student loans, which was satisfied it, but they decided to split it into two, you know, sort of fella. Quite often you'd be told that they need to have some special designers in. I will just knock these things up in the corner on a PC and send them to them. So they did take on a board a number of it. But the reality here on the start checklist and the point that Sam's made is lots of employers think you don't have to do anything and so place their employees on zero T1. They should not be doing that. You need to get the starter checklist. It's actually treated by HMRC as an error situation in their statistical returns. They believe the employer is not fulfilling their duties. Great. Well, good point to, to finish on there. So let's talk about what's happened over the summer. We're going to start with national minimum wage. Uh, there have been some absurd excuses for not paying it as well. I know Samantha's got some great examples of that. So I'm going to pass this over to you, Samantha, to tell us a little bit about some of those. I don't know. I, there's been so many things that have happened over the summer, but I, I'm sure I am not alone in being <laughs> open mouthed at some of the reasons listed, absurd reasons listed for not paying national minimum wage. Because we always think about the, you know, the, the people being named in shame for technical errors, but she does not deserve the national minimum wage because she only makes teas and sweeps the floor. I mean, how shocking is that? How can anyone even admit to that? 
I thought it was okay to pay young workers below the national minimum wage as they're not British and therefore do not have the right to be paid it. John will know this. How many laws are you actually admitting to breaking (laughs) by by saying that? Uh, My workers are often just on standby. Now, this is a common error when there are no customers in the shop. But I only pay them for when they're actually serving someone. I mean, this is touches on like sort of common errors, but my goodness, that's just shocking. Uh, are my employees still learning? They're not entitled to the national minimum wage. That's my culture. You don't pay young workers for the first three months until they've proved themselves. Wrong, wow. wrong, 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 wrong. Wow. And there are more. Uh, there are more. And, you know, and I think actually publishing this list is a helpful reminder that it isn't always technical errors. There are sometimes many times intentional decisions made not to pay the national minimum wage and national living wage which is why you know we you know we continually talk about it <laughs> and so it's you see the published list of uh, some big names in there There's some big names in the published list but Let's go to Lou for HMRC. Go on. They did run a campaign over the summer about check your payslip. So that was being rolled out to everybody to get them, to encourage them to check their payslip, to make sure that they were getting paid the national minimum wage. And I think it's so important that um, everybody is educated in that as well. Sorry, Nick. Mm-hmm. There's a a slight delay there we're catching over. So let's talk about then why people are failing a national minimum wage, because it's not just about the rate of pay, it's about the rate received. So Simon, tell us why why people are failing. What's this uh, misconception or this misunderstanding? Well, you're quite right. And uh, it's it's probably a phrase I come out with. It's not about the pay rate. It's about the rate received, as you said, Nick. And that's because there are lots of rules around it. Also, sometimes it's seen as perceived as a payroll problem. And that payroll should solve this. And uh, those who've been through an HMRC inspection will understand, an audit, will understand it's not about payroll necessarily, Mm. because they'll go and interview people on the floor to find out what happens. So as Almond, as a business, you may think you want to be compliant with national minimum wage. That's all uh, what we want to do. Yet you'll set uh, expense targets for a branch. And... uh, branch managers thinking, how do I get my expenses down, but I've still got the work to be done. I'll get everyone to come in half an hour early and we won't pay them. And it's sort of, you've just committed a criminal act for your entire organization by doing that. And so there's an element of thinking about top and tail time. Uh, Some people operate schemes where if you're five minutes late, we'll pay you 15 minutes later or you'll need to stay behind until we can lock up. But we're only paying you to half past, even though it takes 20 more minutes before we can get out. There's all sorts of things. Uniform is another. So you must wear a black top and black shoes. Uh, HMRC will treat that as a business expense, which reduces national minimum wage. Or the inadvertent types of areas that have tended to come up is, um, well, we're offering a discount for purchasing our own goods from our own staff. Any deduction from pay, which is a payment to the employer, reduces national minimum wage pay. Another misconception is overtime, and that is the overtime premium doesn't count. And also leave, uh, statute of maternity pay, sickness, holiday, don't really count for national minimum wage purposes. So that's where it gets into the really confusing area of where most people start to fail, and that's on the application of salary sacrifice arrangements, taking pay cuts for pensions. And you think, well, this is all for the benefit of the employee. But unfortunately, the regulations don't support that. And so um, we actually end up committing a criminal activity. Am I all right saying it's a criminal activity, John? Because I think it is a criminal activity. It's not a civil uh, law breach. Yes, that's right. I've got the same sort of experience as, as you, Simon, in terms of the, the common issues that, that we get. And uniforms is, is a big one, particularly dress codes. And um, but what employers sometimes don't realise is that there's no limit within the national minimum wage regulations, uh, which if anyone's uh, you know looking for something to, to you know, confuse them by reading through, then read the regulations. It's best approached with a, a wet towel on your head and a gin and tonic in your hand. Uh, but what it means is, if, for example, you've got a dress code that someone has to wear black trousers, 
there's nothing to prevent them going and uh, buying some from Emporio Armani at £110 and, and claiming them back. So if you have got a dress code, then you may want to direct them to, to a particular store to buy some particular clothes. So uniforms are a big issue. Again, same as you, Simon. It is those issues around shift handovers uh, where people stay behind for an extra 10 minutes because they have to hand over to the next person on the shift. Uh, and searching, of course, has been a, a big issue uh, when people clock off and they're searched when leaving a, a particular site. We, we've seen some which are you know, unusual and unintentional. So, for example, when the clocks change, uh, and people sometimes work an extra hour on shift when the clocks change, they're not paid for that hour. So we've seen that. But one of the issues where we see uh, a lot of potential failures in respect of salaried hours, because if people are, are working salaried hours, uh, then HMRC's view is that the overall hours need to be ascertained from the contract. But of course, if you have weekly hours, say 42 hours per week, HMRC sometimes we've seen take the view that the basic hours can't be ascertained because there are more than 52 weeks in any given year. So it, it's an area where, where angels fear to tread in, in certain respects for national minimum wage. Uh, and you're right, Sam, there are people who deliberately don't pay national minimum wage. Uh, but in my experience, most of the breaches are inadvertent. Uh, and for most of the time, you know, people just don't realise that they are in breach of, of national minimum wage. Actually, well, I, can, I, can I just add then, Nick, um, that I think next year's uh, campaign to check your payslip, uh, amongst other things, will have, uh, well, I follow John Keeble's advice. I was reading the regulations whilst drinking gin. <laughs> yes, well, well, I, I, I'm surprised that you, you can't paste my advice for the absurd excuses. Well, hopefully you haven't lost too many attendees while they're, they can listen, of course. You can go into listen only mode if you're currently shopping on Employer Armani for some new trousers at the same time. No one will ever know. While we'll do that, there have, of course, been a new health and social care levy as well. The government this week announced the introduction of the new levy to help pay for the NHS and social care reforms. Before we get into this full discussion, we've had a couple of questions in as well. I'm going to jump to you, um, Simon, if I can, for this quick question that's come in, which says, what about private fuel deductions for company car drivers? Drivers. Um, we deduct for the private mileage for the cost of fuel on the fuel card, so it doesn't need to be a P11D item. Yeah, I think it's an element of considering what that means. Would that be treated as a deduction for the benefit of the employer? I think you're deducting that from a benefit item amount, so it has a reduction. It's an interesting point. I might have to think about it, and maybe that's one of the types of things we'll come back to in the question and answers we publish after. There's an element of what's the payment for and who's it going to. But, uh, yeah, any thoughts there, Sam, actually? I'll see what you thought. Mm. I, I'm like you, Simon. I would need to, to go back and double-check to make sure my understanding would be right. And one thing that it highlights, I think, is the difference of treatment depending on whether or not we're looking at something from a, an income tax reporting for benefits in kind and benefits code or pay as you earn basis, as opposed to for national minimum wage purposes. And quite often there's a diversion between what guidance will say for the benefits code and treatment of, of a payment, almost suggesting that it's perfectly acceptable to have that payment. But it's actually that guidance is only talking about how you would treat that amount for tax purposes or NIC purposes. And then, of course, you've got the guidance that talks about talks to national minimum wage. And I, I must confess, I've never seen that used as an example of something that would reduce national minimum wage yeah. amounts. But that's yeah. not to say I would need to double check that uh, and we can put that in the answers that go out if that's if that's OK. Nick, for sure. We, we do like the questions that baffle the panel. So do keep them yeah. coming. Do. You know, it gives us, keep them on their toes. I think it's incredibly important that we do that. I don't know if the poll results have come in um, yet. But while we're waiting for those, Simon, I think we're going to add, add a point to the end of that, will you? 
Well, yeah. I mean, my gut instinct is it does reduce the pay for national minimum wage purposes. That's that, but that's a gut instinct. But the only thing is because companies operate in two different ways. Sometimes for private fuel card, they'll have what they call a contribution amount, which is just fixed. So it doesn't actually get rid of the P11D value at all. Uh, but they're just allowing contribution for private. But it does reduce quite often the benefit value of the vehicle that's used for private use. So there's ways of playing the values to have effects on taxation. But it is a payment to the employer. So on that basis, my gut instinct is it probably does reduce it. But we'll look at it a little bit more. It's an interesting one. So, Simon, can you tell us a little bit more about this, you know, the social care funding, how that's going to really impact? Is it going to come from national insurance contributions? Is it going to come from dividends? What should we be aware of going forward? Yeah, sure. Well, initial thing is, uh, if you look at your NI bill as an employer, you're in effect going to pay 9.06% more or 9.058, depending on how you round it, but uh, roughly just under 9.1% more in employer national insurance than you did before. Equally, you've got that those increases that are affecting your employees as well, if they earn sufficient. However, it has been confirmed that the employment allowance can be offset against it initially. Whether that will be the case in 2023 is something to look at. And also, questions have been fired off. You know, There was a meeting yesterday and fired off some questions in relation to it. Initially, we know it's a rise to 13.25% employee, 15.05% employer contributions from April 22. They then revert back to 12% and 13.8% with a new levy separate coming in. Also, there's this requirement that they're hinting that they want employers to actually put a message on the pay statements, pay slips, pay notices online, whatever, to actually say, oh, and by the way, you've contributed to the health and social care uh, levy. We don't know what that message exactly is yet, but they're asking employers to do that. So there are some implications. And then for 23, there's an element of, well, how's that going to work. For example, in the case of attachment of earnings orders, the attachable earnings is reduced firstly by tax and national insurance, but there is nothing necessary in the law that will have it being reduced by a health and social care levy. So for 22-23, you think, yes, it's all included because national insurance is knocked off, but in 23-24, it's not national insurance anymore. Plus, it's been stated this is for class one, Class 1A, Class 1B, and Class 4, which is to do with self-employed. So that's okay for this coming year if it's just 15.05%. How does that operate when it reverts back to 13.8? So does the PSA, uh, does the uh, P11D going to have a 1.25% liability applied to benefit results? And I guess we just don't know at the moment. And Samantha, there's been loads of conversation about the impact of the national insurance contributions increase within the payroll community. We've seen loads of questions sort of going back and forth. What are the what are the biggest concerns that you've seen in terms of the questions that are coming through and what, what should we be be mindful of? Well, depending on where you sit within the payroll industry, if you're serving clients, then your phones uh, and email box inboxes will have been ringing hot with questions about how this is going to impact the costs for those employers going forward. So clients will be demanding to know how this is going to affect them and seeking reassurance that the payroll service is going to be ready and fit for purpose to deliver that. Uh, in the meantime, the payroll professionals working within uh, payroll services are waiting to receive that confirmation from software developers. And as Simon's just demonstrated, meetings are being held, questions are being asked. But that doesn't mean to say that the questions are being answered with any accuracy. From another perspective, I confess I was quite pleased. Well, I've, I've, it's wrong to say I was quite pleased to see it published, but Uh, One of the joys of going back to training work with colleagues is when we're doing the refresher training on national insurance contributions and the pay-as-you-earn system, I kind of emphasised so much over this last year how the Social Security and national insurance contributions specifically are used by government to drive behaviour from employers, but also to fulfil their policies. Um, And that's happened over a number of years. And this is a really good example (laughs) to all of my colleagues who are new to payroll um, of yet another situation. And of course, let's not forget 
But in addition to this, and we will be talking about veterans and free ports as well, we are going to be seeing uh, an opportunity for employers to make savings on their secondary NICs by employing veterans, by having employees work over 60% of their time within free port areas, of which there will be 11 around the, the UK. And of course, not forgetting the the younger employees under 21 or apprentices under 25, there's an opportunity there for employers to be making savings already on their secondary NICs. So um, we might start to see a move by employers to thinking about, actually, could we make better use of young people within our workforce? Could we support apprenticeships within our business? Because if to do so is going to save us money. I'm intrigued about this message on the pay step. I won't lie to you. I, you know, I'd like to think that if it is going to be a requirement from government, that software developers will be able to build that in to their products to take away the burden of, particularly when you were a payroll service with, with thousands of clients, actually having to add that message into your pay slips on a per employer basis. So there's concerns there. I mean, I'll be honest, if, if we were able to answer these polls, I would sit in those top three boxes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm intrigued, actually, to know whether or not anybody's added anything in the chat box for that 4% in terms of how well, people feel about that. Nothing on the 4%, but there has been a question asked, and I'm loving these. They're coming through thick and fast. So let's answer all here. I'll come to you, Lou, for this one, if I may. They've asked, um, it's Jacqueline Nagar has asked, can you give us more information on how we would go about setting up a salary sacrifice scheme for season ticket loans, purchasing an electric car? We currently operate a season ticket loan, but it's just a net deduction. The electric car would be a new thing. Any advice would be useful. There are certain things that have elements of exemption, but I'm going to caveat it. There's articles out today with Rishi Sunak saying that he may well stamp on sorry, sacrifice arrangements uh, at some point or other, because, of course, he's fearing that they'll become extremely popular now that employer costs have gone up by 9.1%. So the for Electric cars or cars under 75 grams don't fall under the OPERA rules. OPERA is optional remuneration arrangements, and it was a measure brought in back in 2017. I'm saying that from memory, April 2017, to curtail the use of salary sacrifice. So salary sacrifice has, in effect, been limited now to childcare cycling to work schemes, pensions, and there's probably something else, and I can't remember who it was. Uh, but pensions one of the things right. is yeah. uh, pensions, are vital. plus there's an element of company cars used to be a popular salary sacrifice scheme tool, especially in local government even, but uh, it's been limited that uh, they don't work. If you salary sacrifice, the amount sacrificed becomes taxable and subject to class 1a so the employer saves nothing within certain times and there was what they called a grandfathering period that grandfathering period has ended so none of the prior arrangements continue but it still works for electric cars those that uh, produce under 75 grams so uh, yeah you don't have to get permission necessarily you can or you used to be able to get clearance from a section of HMRC the salary sacrifice scheme was effective but in effect you have your employee agree to a pay cut and you give them a company car in return on that basis your uh, tax and then our liabilities are reduced to the amount of your net pay that you have after the sacrifice Perfect. does that help a little bit I think that's a yeah. very well put, Simon. Thank you ever so much for taking the question. And coming back to you, Samantha, you said you're yes. interested well, in I'll that. Cave, I'll, caveat, I'll caveat that, Nick, with uh, in the capacity of us here, I can't give tax advice. I only can point you in the right direction of information and you need to seek your own professional advice. Of course, of course. Sorry. Samantha, you, you said you're interested in the 4% answers. I did yes. have someone, yeah. uh, Andrew Williams, actually put a comment in to say, my main Thank concern you, was, as you highlighted, was the pay slip message. So he echoed right. that at what you mentioned oh, as well. No, thank you. We've got lots thank to get you. through. It is National Prayer Week, but we still so we've got something else to celebrate, which is the end of COVID-19 special measures. Uh, the only other summer news I think I had to mention from that slide was the spending review and autumn budget day has also been announced. Uh, the chance of the executive revealed the autumn budget will be held on the 27th of October 2021. I think we'll leave that for uh, the October PQTV 
potentially, but uh, news nonetheless. The end of CGRS, some ongoing challenges. I'm going to come to you, John Akeeble, actually, if I may, before we get into the legislative side. Just talk about if employers want to reduce salaries because staff are now based at home. That's a question we've had a lot on the payroll chats that I've been involved in. What if you could help me with that question? Because a lot of employers seem to think they can reduce salaries if staff are now based at home and they don't want them to return to the office. I wonder if you could help me with that, John, before we jump into the uh, the challenges of, uh, of CGOS ending. Yeah, well, I, I think that's that's going to be potentially problematic um, because, of course, employees will have a contractual right uh, to a salary that will be set out in their contract of employment or Section 1 terms and conditions. Uh, and if they have a contractual right to that salary, uh, it's very difficult to vary that without their consent to that. Um, it is possible, if you want to change terms and conditions, um, to go through a process if employees don't agree to terminate their employment uh, and re-engage them on new terms. But for obvious reasons, that's something of a, a nuclear option uh, <laughs> for employers. Um, sure. And not good for, for really employee relations. Uh, and there's an added issue uh, on that as well, that depending on the numbers, you may have to engage in a collective consultation process. So you'll, you'll understand from an employment perspective, employees have lots of rights and there's nothing which is probably more protected uh, than the level of their pay, Nick. Excellent. Of course, numbers on furlough have now fallen to their lowest level since the start of the pandemic. Because right now, the UK economy continues to rebound, business are reopening, and new statistics are all looking positive on the economy at the minute in terms of businesses coming back to fruition, bringing welcoming people back. But of course, there's a, there's going to be some implications here as we end CGRS. So, Simon, what are the ongoing challenges? Um, I wonder if you could uh, highlight those to our, to our listeners. I'll do my best, Nick, and we'll see. I may need some others to chip in as well. But uh, as uh, Lou's saying, uh, CJRS is coming to an end. Um, lots of employers would have been sent letters uh, indicating that you need to check claims. And uh, there's still a lot on social media that we see in discussions where there's a lot of misunderstanding. But it's sort of everything's winding down now with CJRS. Let's get back to normality. Uh, sickness was announced as well. So uh, COVID SSP sickness is there. But uh, lots of confusion over pay rises. Does that affect uh, reference pay, usual hours, etc.? Anyone else want to help me out on this one? I think there's some news on flexible SSP, wasn't there, Samantha? Flexible. Flexible yes. SSP. Well, yes, of course. As Simon's just mentioned, it's now been announced that the reclaim or the ability for smaller employers, uh, that's employers who have 250 le- uh, or less employees across all pay-as-you-earn schemes as at uh, 28th of February 2020, if you can cast your mind at that far, they were able or have been able to reclaim up to two weeks SSP so long as the employee was absent from work due to some coronavirus reason, which may include self-isolation. It may include the fact that they are, have symptoms themselves. It may include the fact that they live with someone who has symptoms. It may include the fact that they've received a shielding letter um, advising them to shield during that period. So there's a whole number of reasons. Uh, it does not include quarantine. Um, so the people coming back into the country who are being required to or have been required to, to quarantine. So that's not included in there. There's a whole number of dates to sort of be wary of, uh, which reflects the, the, the different dates in which legislation was brought in um, as, as government caught up with the different reasons why SSP might be payable. So, uh, as I say, they could reclaim up to two weeks for their employees and that ends as at the 30th of September. So that's for absences for COVID or coronavirus reasons up to and including the 30th of September. And employers then have up to uh, 31st of December in order to reclaim those amounts or make any corrections if they discover they've made errors and then that they need to keep their records uh, because of course state aid de minimis state aid comes into this because of the restriction to smaller employers only um, i.e that 250 employees uh, across all page earn schemes that means that this classes as state aid and so the employer would need to keep the state aid declaration 
information which would come when they reclaim their amounts. They would need to keep that statement for uh, three years to 31st of December 2024. But to pick up on what Lou said about the audit process and, you know, that that follows the poll that we kept, employers are required to keep their records of their claims for up to six years. And this shows how, I mean, the, the message all along has been that HMRC won't look to punish harshly innocent errors. Um, however, that long period of time for record keeping reflects the seriousness by which they see any errors. And then, of course, you know, let's not forget there's also employers who have the larger employers particularly have decided actually with the benefit of hindsight, their business wasn't as duly affected by COVID as they thought it would be. So actually they've repaid the amount. So there's there's almost a question there whether or not morally certain businesses who haven't been unduly affected by COVID, their business, you know, actually might have blossomed during that period of time. And there may be many good reasons for that. They may actually consider repaying those amounts. Not that there's any reason why they should do, but nevertheless, um, you know, that's uh, an area that is being considered by certain businesses. When it comes to John Keeble, from returning to the workplace, uh, the workplace, the implications, double jab for a job. Catching title, and thanks for that hot potato, Nick. <laughs> but uh, I suppose just to, to set some sort of context um, to, to vaccination, there is some mandatory vaccination. So, for example, for workers in registered care homes from 11th of November, they will have to be uh, vaccinated. Uh, and there's a consultation uh, which is going to be launched as to whether to extend that to workers in the health and social care sectors. Um, But outside that, there is no legislative power, which the UK government has, uh, for across-the-board vaccinations. So if they were going to introduce it, it would require primary legislation uh, to do so. So so the approach at at the moment really is one of um, encouragement. And uh, if employers do want people to be vaccinated, Uh, that would be the approach that I would probably take uh, rather than mandating it. Uh, And that's for for a number of reasons. Um, Firstly, there are some individuals for whom vaccination might not be suitable. Uh, For example, those who are immunosuppressed, um, those with long COVID, uh, are sometimes advised uh, against having the vaccine so they can track the underlying conditions, um, etc., But if you are going to uh, require employees to be vaccinated, um, then I would tread reasonably carefully, uh, because in the earlier part of this year, the view of the Equality and Human Rights Commission uh, was that a blanket mandatory vaccination policy uh, was likely to be unlawful and potentially discriminatory. So it is something that you should think carefully about uh, before you decide to go down the route of mandatory vaccination uh, for uh, employees. And uh, I think some of the risks uh, that there are uh, in it relate to uh, discrimination. Uh, so, for example, from a sex discrimination point of view, uh, there are some women who may wish to delay vaccination because uh, they're trying to conceive and there hasn't been testing of the vaccine uh, as against uh, pregnant women. And uh, another way of of discrimination would be in terms of philosophical belief, which is a protected characteristic. And so certain employees, for example, may reject the vaccine because embryonic tissue was used to test or develop the vaccine. So there are risks on that front. And uh, of course, requiring an employee to be vaccinated without consent um, could be seen as a fundamental breach Uh, of their employment contract, which means they could resign uh, and claim uh, constructive dismissal. So I I think I would tread carefully um, on that. I think similar considerations also apply if what you're making is an offer of employment which is conditional on proof of vaccination. Uh, And that also raises data protection issues, um, which need to be carefully addressed uh, about retaining uh, and retaining um, this type of, of information. Uh, And of course, if you go down that route, uh, there may be delays in the recruitment process uh, and you may not get uh, a suitable pool of of candidates, particularly in the current job market, uh, which, as you've identified, Nick, is is pretty hot. um, It is. At the moment. So I I think I would generally generally tread 
fairly carefully if you're going to go down the route of, of mandatory vaccination. Uh, and you really should take some specific legal advice on it uh, because it's an area where it's, it's clearly fraught with some degree of risk, uh, both for current employees, um, those you're making job offers to, uh, and also if you are considering making it a condition in any job advert. Go slowly and carefully would be my advice. I'm not sure this subject matter will be going away. It's hot in the press for the uh, the Premier League, isn't it, with all the uh, Champions League travel and the Brazil-Argentina <laughs> game. So... Um, yeah. A lot of conversations there. So we're going to make it mandatory for Premier League players. So we're obviously legally at the minute they can't, right? But um, let's see how that unfolds. Uh, I'm going to keep it with you, John, for the moment as well, because while we're talking about the end of CGRS, um, the coronavirus uh, right to work checks, the end date for the temporary adjusted checks has been deferred to the 5th of April 2022, as I understand it. Um, wanted yes. you to tell us a little bit more about that. Well, I, I, I don't have much more to say on that. I understand it's been extended, and I think that relates to the way in which those those checks can be carried out in terms of it not being face-to-face. Uh, I think sure. that's the, the, the fundamental change. Fabulous. Well, let's take it to the next slide then. Planning for 2022-2023, HMRC. How will it aff- affect businesses? I'm going left to right. I'm going to start this one with you, Simon, if I may. OK, with well, the other big announcement for National Payroll Week, because we'll be in the minds of Rishi Sunak, was the date of the budget. So as opposed to this last year, where the budget was sort of cancelled or delayed and we had it in March for an April delivery, uh, the budget has been announced as the 27th of October. So hopefully we'll have a little bit more planning. I don't know if that affects payroll professionals as much as the software developers side, because it just means uh, we now have three months to squeeze things in instead of three days or, or negative three days, as it felt this year. But it, uh, it potentially puts us in a position of knowing a little bit more about what's happening, which has been absent for about three years. So this is the first time we're be looking like we might be getting back to some form of normality. So uh, we know about some things that will start affecting business, and there's an element of whether you plan to take advantage. We talked about some of this before. So health and social care levy is uh, putting on a bit of a rise, 15% uh, national insurance over uh, for employers. Do you want to consider uh, veterans because there's the new veterans national insurance holiday which actually came in this year but the hmrc couldn't get ready in time for their system so you have to do a retrospective claim but will form part of payroll next year and also the implications for freeport although i don't think that will affect many employers uh, unless you've got a worker i think I'm saying this from memory, if you've got workers that spend at least 60% of their work time in a free port area uh, undertaking work for you, uh, and then it would only apply to those. But uh, there's meant to be an establishment of 11 new free ports, and businesses associated with that free port area can again get a national insurance holiday to a, what potentially be a lower upper uh, threshold value than the one we're used to uh, for veterans, students and apprentices. So yes, quite a bit happening. Saying that, on tax, we're not expecting any change, are we? Well, apart from Scotland, maybe. Vanfer, you mentioned a little bit earlier about the uh, Freeport and Veterans uh, NI. Anything you want to add to that? Well, I was just re- refreshing my memory as to the categories because this was announced in the software developer uh, information back at the beginning of August, I think it was. Category V, of course, is being introduced to deal with the veterans' savings. So we've got a new acronym, VUST, presumably veteran upper secondary threshold. And then, of course, for so where actually where there are other categories that could be impacted, then I think. Uh, if, if I re- understood the guidance correctly, it would be you would need to contact HMRC to be able to make a manual adjustment, which was for the veterans. But with the Freeport mm-hmm. employees, we've got four new categories uh, in operation. So we've got F. So again, new acronym, FUST. FUST. <laughs> it's a shame there's not a Y on the end of there. FUSTY, I think, would have, would have been a really good one. But that's uh, Freeport, upper secondary threshold, which, as Simon suggested, could be at a different rate to the other 
upper secondary thresholds. So F category F replaces A situations. Category I replaces B, which is a real flashback. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd be intrigued to know how many people that would affect. Category S would be the equal or the equivalent to category C. And category L would be the equivalent to category J. So, of course, that's where you've got deferred. <laughs> Sorry, Nick, I just like to throw a bit of technology in there. I mean, Simon, well, I do and not pay off, so I'm quite happy. Yeah, uh, well, it's, just, it's all a bit of fizzle, isn't it, really? It is a bit of fizzle, but I think, you know, we, we like the fizzle every now and again, Simon. Yeah. So, you know, don't, don't rob me of my joy on that one. <laughs> Can I just actually talk about the flexible SSP, which is on the other slide? Mm -hmm. I think the reason we talked about that um, was there was an announcement made earlier, and this might affect anyone who's been keeping sort of a close eye on the consultations that have been carried out over recent years on the idea or the notion of introducing greater flexibility into the statutory sick pay process, because at the moment it really doesn't support phased return to work. Um, and I think, you know, where we were discussing this earlier, Simon made a very valid point that that flexible SSP, the announcement being made that now is not the right time. How often do governments use that phrase? Now is not the right time to introduce those changes. I would say that now is the perfect time. Um, however, government have got their hands full um, in other areas. Uh, and so if you've been keeping an eye out for any changes to SSP, they're not going to be happening anytime soon. Look, we've got still a lot to get through. And I know the misconception yeah. of the holiday pay slide, when we get there, is going to be a good chattable area. So let's move on then to pay gap reporting. Uh, the gender pay gap uh, was been reported recently by PwC that it shrunk for the third consecutive year. The pay gap data for 2021 reporting year showed that the mean pay gap has fallen to 12.5% from 14.3% in the first year reporting in 2017-2018. Um, but how is the gender pay gap progressing and the October deadline for, for gender reporting? Um, Lou or Simon, would you like to, to kick off? Well, yeah, I think it's just reminding us all that uh, the deadlines that we were forgiven last year, they haven't been forgiven this year they were just extended so the april 5th reporting was just related uh, changed to october so have we got that in mind or have we forgotten about it that's sort of the critical message of here is uh you know how are you doing because uh, it's still judged on the same snapshot data point and you've got to think about uh coronavirus job retention scheme, interfering with that, etc. cetera, um, uh, gender recognition, rights to be whoever you want to be, and implications there. Um, maybe I'm being a bit flippant there too much, Nick, but there's an element of um, it's time for HR to get their reporting in. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. And we've got a, a section here on CEA, CEO pay ratios. Um, who would like to take some commentary here? Yeah, well, I, I can chip in um, on this. I mean, I, I think this has been in for, for a, a, a while, and it, it, I think it applies to employers who have more than 250 employees, and there's a requirement um, to report effectively the remuneration, uh, and then as against certain quartiles uh, of employees, uh, the 25th, 50th, and 75th percentage um, in terms of pay. Uh, and that then generates a, a ratio. What it applies to, it's, it's not all companies, it's, it's UK registered quoted, registered traded, and registered unquoted traded companies. And uh, what it doesn't apply is to AIM um, companies. But uh, same as uh, Simon, in terms of, of the way in which um, these things are now measured uh, and assessed, of course, it, it's, Simon's right, there have been a whole host of changes during the COVID scenario that may uh, affect things. We've got furloughed employees, deferred bonuses that have been put off for this year, changes to the size of LTIPs uh, and the grant of those adjusted performance measures. All of these things uh, are going to have a reasonably significant effect, uh, I think, on what the differential um, is going to be for the CEO pay ratio uh, reporting. I know we touched upon ethnicity reporting briefly in previous PQTs, but uh, Simon or John, would you like to talk about the ethnicity reporting proposal? Well, yeah, I, I, I can pick that up. It's it's something which is is a, a, a slow burn on this because the consultation, I think, was launched in 2018 uh, and it closed in January 2019. And as far as I'm aware, the government hasn't formally responded to that consultation. 
um, although uh, the BBC did get some access to um, information. And uh, I think the end result of the consultation from those who uh, responded to it uh, was over 70% of those who responded um, thought that it was a good idea for employers at the 250 employee mark and above. Um, where there wasn't you know, unanimity, I think, in the response to the consultation uh, is how you are going to cut it um, when looking at um, ethnicity. Uh, and there were mixed views. Um, some were of the view that uh, the split should be, on the one hand, just between white and on the other hand, BAME, uh, and others had a different view. Uh, and there are going to be some interesting questions about who it's going to be cut if this comes in, uh, because one of the statistics, if you look at uh, the way that these things are, are currently reported, because around 20 plus percent of, of companies report this information anyway, um, for, for example, uh, employees who are Chinese uh, on average earn 30 percent more than those who are Pakistani. Uh, and that's, that's information that, depending on how you define ethnicity, may be captured or may be lost because you just defined ethnicity as Asian, then people would be in one group. So there are some interesting questions for how this is going to actually operate in practice, um, depending on how ethnicity is, is defined uh, within um, uh, any paid reporting proposals. Uh, but at the moment, uh, this is, is somewhat on the back burner. Uh, like everything else, it wasn't covered off in the Queen's speech, uh, the Taylor report, provisions, etc. They just didn't appear. So when this will see the light of day, uh, I think is somewhat up in the air. Fantastic. So we'll, we'll watch this space. So listen, we're going to go to what I know is going to be a, a really informative discussion, which is all about the misconceptions of holiday pay. I guess we're going to update you all really on the categorization of workers. And then we're going to get into the discussion about entitlement and how this is different to holiday pay. But let's start with the categorization piece. I'll come to you for this, Samantha, if I can. Talk to us a little bit about the misconceptions of holiday pay in relation to the categorization of workers. Well, yes, I think that it's, you've put it in a nutshell there. The term is workers as opposed to employees. So all workers are entitled to holiday pay uh, or ha have uh, entitlement to holiday leave. Um, and that would include employees because all employees are workers, but not all workers are employees. Agency workers, zero hours workers, anyone really. And I think uh, I, uh, John will probably know more about this than me. But I think there have been some recent cases on uh, the gig economy that have settled the fact that these are workers and therefore entitled to holiday leave, even though they may be self-employed for tax purposes. Uh, and John might be able to add some more there. And I think that, you know, this can be a common misconception or a common area where problems can arise. Um, I think the reason we like to talk about holiday pay is because of the potential for the single enforcement body that is being introduced to take on state enforcement of holiday pay for vulnerable workers. Um, the, I don't think there's any dates that are imminent, but um, that's why it, it makes for a very interesting subject for us to talk about. Excellent. Fantastic. Now, of course, a lot of misconceptions around entitlement, which is different to holiday pay. So, Simon, tell us a little bit about why there are misconceptions between the two. Yeah, sure, Nick. And, and you know me, I like to uh, rattle the stick inside the wasp's nest at times. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an element of on the 60 percent, there may be an element of are you sure? Mm -hmm. uh, because increasingly I'm not sure that actually so people may think they're compliant with the law, but do they actually understand the regulation? So there are two areas that people get wrong. And you often see it, we see it all the time in social media, employment law and payroll is, uh, of course, zero hours workers aren't entitled to a holiday. They're entitled to 5.6 paid weeks. And there's an element of almost all category of worker uh, is entitled to 5.6 week holiday and it's prorated on a basis. And, uh, and then, of course, what does that mean and where do bank holidays fall? So the types of areas where there's misconception is understanding what bank holidays are. I mean, recent questions I've seen is, well, we pay the 20 days and, uh, and it says in the contract plus bank holidays, but bank holidays don't have to be paid, so we don't pay it. And there's an element of if the contract says 20 days plus bank holidays, it means that you do pay it. 
So not paying it means you're in breach of your contract already. Uh, but you can have 20 days plus bank holidays paid. And it's a question of that means you have to pay it for everyone then, doesn't it? Even if they don't normally work Monday. So be very careful with what you're saying in your contracts of employment. The other is aspect of everybody does accrual within the law. Accrual only applies to the first year of employment. It doesn't apply any other year. So you may be wanting to control entitlement usage uh, so that people don't get too far ahead, but they don't actually accrual apart from the first year under the law. So there's an understanding of what the regulations are, and it falls into two parts. One is entitlement, and the other is on payment. So entitlement generally is 5.6 weeks paid weeks uh, entitlement. What is a week? The law is a bit loose on that. All they're saying is, but it has to be paid. The other aspect then is what holiday pay. So what is holiday pay for a week's leave? And a holiday pay for a week's leave is the average of the prior 52 weeks pay, excluding any zero pay weeks or affected weeks. So they'd say any non-normal weeks. So you could say actually weeks on furlough should not be included in that averaging. So it's look at when people were paid normally, even if they're on variable hours, and only count weeks where they had pay. And you go back 104 weeks maximum to find those 52 weeks. And if you have less than 52 weeks, you average it over the number of weeks you found with normal pay. And that's your average weekly earnings. Multiply that by the entitlement they're using. You've got your holiday pay. Do most of the employers do that in the UK? I'm not sure they do. And that's why I tend to say with the 60%, it might be actually worthwhile revisiting what the law actually says. The other types of questions I've seen that are raised are about, well, we do our holiday in hours. And uh, they started on this date and they ended mid-year. And we calculate that because that was 79 days out of 365 times this times seven and a half hours. That comes up with this entitlement. And it's an element of what does the law require you to do on accrual? And you'll find that, uh, say, it falls under Working Time Directive, Regulation 15A, 2A, it states, leave is deemed to accrue over the course of the worker's first year of employment at the rate of one twelfth. So if you work a day, you get a month of 5.6 weeks. If you work a month and a day, you get two months of 5.6 weeks. And, and that only applies to the first year. And so it's just understanding what they are. And then they'll say, but we do it in hours. So what does that mean? And then it goes under regulation 15A, brackets three. It states where the amount of leave that has accrued in a particular place includes a fraction of a day other than a half day, the fraction shall be treated as a half day. If it is less than a half day and a whole day, if it is more than a uh, half day. So what does that mean for hours? It means you have to work out what the daily entitlement is first and then multiply it by the number of hours in the, that day. You can't just divide hours by the fraction. It doesn't work. And those are why there are lots of misconceptions and people going, oh, and they may say, well, the way we do it means they get more. Sometimes it might. Sometimes it might mean they get less. And you can pay more than the statutory minimum, but what you're not meant to do is pay less. But at the moment, and I guess it's an element of uh, propensity to challenge, the only means of challenge for an employee at the moment is to take an employer to an employment tribunal. In future, when the single enforcer comes in, you just make a complaint to the enforcer. And, well, two uh, questions coming different. here, Simon. So sure. uh, maybe these are outside of the 60%. One is, um, how is the calculation affected by commissions and bonuses, particularly if uh, a large commission or bonus comes in perhaps just before you know, they take their holiday, so it just falls into that, that 52 weeks? How does that impact yes. on the calculation? It certainly does. So uh, commission is included and bonus if it's associated with work. 
So if it's for the course of duties, then it's included. But bonus that isn't associated with uh, for the performance of duties isn't. So if it was, a, for example, a Christmas bonus that's given to everybody, you may find that it doesn't have to be included. But if it's a bonus because your department or you've done something special uh, because of the way you've worked, then it would potentially fall within holiday pay averaging requirements. Fantastic. And the other question I've got here is I have self-employed people working for us. Cest assessments have been completed for all of these people and they all come out of self-employed. Do I have to pay holiday pay? I didn't think so, but now I doubt myself. The element is whether they're considered a worker and self truly self-employed people, uh, you wouldn't have to pay holiday for. Uh, John may be able to comment there a little bit more, but there's a lot of confusion about what self-employment means. And so um, contractors generally are not self-employed. They're employees of their own business. They're not self-employed at all. So IR35 doesn't apply to self-employed people. It can't. But it does apply to personal service companies who, in effect, work for themselves. Does that, is that, there's a difference between working for your own company that you own as a director and working as a sole trader. Any thoughts there, John? No, I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that. Just add a, just a, a couple of comments on, on misconceptions. Uh, I think probably the biggest one that, that we find is, is that uh, employers assume uh, that you uh, accrue a holiday by working uh, and you don't. You, you, you have holiday uh, as an entitlement because you are employed uh, and that can cause a, a whole host of issues with people assessing, particularly if you have people working somewhat irregular patterns or on a casual basis or the such like, and it, it can cause uh, fairly significant issues um, in all of that. Uh, the other area where we see employers uh, getting it fairly wrong fairly often uh, relates to the holiday pay and, and what goes in it. And you've covered off, Simon, the commission, which obviously has to be um, included. And uh, there's the overtime issue as well, which is a, a little bit vexed because overtime generally is included but it should be regular over time. And quite what regular means is anyone's guess, yeah. because you can have something which isn't particularly frequent, but would be regular. So uh, there are all sorts of tricky issues, and there are still a, a significant cohort of, of employers who just don't pay uh, for any of these matters in terms of holiday pay of the overtime, the commission, you know, productivity bonuses, um, all these elements which are intrinsically linked to the performance of tasks. Um, and some of it is a question of them not being aware. Um, some of it is a question of they are aware, but given that the holiday pay claim is limited going backwards for two years, um, if you don't pay for five years, then on, on one basis, um, you're doing okay. But, but I suspect there's gonna be a whole host of employers who are, are busy revisiting what they're going to be doing with the spectre of, of single enforcement coming down the track. Yeah, nice, nicely highlighted. Well, there's another question that's just come in as well. So uh, it's great to see uh, such interaction here. So do keep them coming if there's something, a uh, burning question you want to go off your chest, because still got a few minutes left to go before we close this off. So should leavers receiving a pylon receive an element of holiday pay for the notice we are paying out? No. So the holiday payment is to the termination date. The pylon doesn't extend the termination date because you're paying it instead of giving them working or giving them notice. Is that? I think that's where we're coming from, isn't it, John? Yes. Clearly, if someone works out their notice, they'll still be employed, still be accruing holiday. But the, the essence of a payment in lieu of notice is that your employment will terminate uh, at that point, uh, and therefore there is no uh, you know, entitlement to, to holiday pay on the pylon because it's not a period of work. Yes. And any implica implications you mentioned here for national minimum wage? Yeah, I think the reason that's there is one of the most frequent questions uh, we're asked on NMW enforcement is uh, the inclusion of holiday pay. And the reality is when a, a HMRC come in and do an audit, they will totally ignore holiday pay because it's got nothing to do with working. It's to do with not working. And so be careful. So if you've got a period that has a period of pay and holiday pay, and you've operated a salary sacrifice, they'll ignore the holiday pay and they'll look at the pay and say for the hours worked, 
is that uh, paid, which seems an odd. And it's one I've raised at the uh, National Minimum Wage Stakeholder Group, which I'm part of, uh, that's operated by Bayes and HMRC. There's a group of uh, specialists that attend that. Uh, they run it about twice a year with questions because it seems innate that if you're on holiday for the whole period and you had a salary sacrifice of the holiday pay because your holiday pay was what you would normally earn, that would be fine because national minimum wage would not be tested in that period because you haven't worked. But if you had half and half, the you've earned exactly the same amount of money as if you would as if you'd worked. The salary sacrifice is going to be judged against half the money and not all the money because half of it's holiday. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Hopefully, uh, I'm, I think I might be confusing people. It is confusing. And that's the challenge with minimum wage is it's very confusing uh, and it's not inclusive. So I get questions on uh, what about if they are an SMP? Does national minimum wage apply? And the answer is no, because they're not working. Uh, what about if they're on furlough? Does it apply? And it should have risen because of uh, the raises in national minimum wage. And it's sort of, well, they're not working, are they? So it doesn't apply. Does that help a little bit? But that's the implication of national minimum wage is that holiday pay doesn't count towards national minimum wage rates. And if you're operating salary sacrifice and the deductions for the benefit of the employer, they won't consider it off the holiday pay. They'll consider it off the normal pay. I'm conscious of time. So I'm going to come to one more question. I don't know if they're in the 60% or not, and I won't mention who the question comes from. But um, you did, we talked about going back two years rather than five in your example, John. What are the implications if employers do not include bonus and commission payments to holiday pay calculations? Well, if, if, you, if you don't include it, there can be a, a claim which is brought by a, an employee in respect of, of those amounts. Generally, in an employment tribunal, all claims would need to be brought within three months uh, of the termination of employment, although that's slightly extended because you've got an ACAS process that you have to go through first before you can submit your claim. And if a claim is put in, then a tribunal will determine it. But uh, to say the backstop is that they will only go back and, and look at the, the previous two-year period um, in sure. assessing the value of the holiday pay claim. Sorry, it's an, it's an element of understanding what the single enforcer will do. And I guess we don't necessarily know. But uh, as John's saying, uh, if, if I feel I'm underpaid, I can take my employer to an employment tribunal. Uh, if my friend is underpaid, my case has got nothing to do with them. Uh, the court won't look at him, even though he may be being underpaid as well. But when the single enforcer comes in, uh, they may actually find that I've been paid OK. But my friends, they may find hasn't. Will they enforce the payment? And that's how it operates with national minimum wage. So people report a problem with national minimum wage. They don't just look at that one case. They look at everyone. I'm with you, Simon. I'm, I'm anticipating that, that it's largely going to operate on the same basis and in the same way. We're going to jump to hot topics. We've got a couple of minutes just to run through some of these. I'm going to run through the first one. The Republic of Ireland has a new sick leave pay regulations. It currently does not have a mandatory sick pay scheme, and the decision as to whether employees receive pay during periods of sick leave is a matter for each individual employer. So this is very much uh, reliant just uh, to the Republic of Ireland employees if you have a Republic of Ireland payroll, because this is about to change. Soon employers will be required to provide statutory sick pay to employees under proposed draft legislation uh, called the sick bill leave uh, 2021 or the 2021 bill. So look out for more information on that, particularly if you have a Republic of Ireland payroll. And um, we've kind of covered our 35 in, in a lot of diesel over the previous ones. Uh, any uh, additional sound bites, John, to mention here? Uh, I'd say just in terms of a couple of trends that, that we're seeing, uh, we are seeing a significant number of employers uh, who are moving away from contractors because they just don't want to engage with an IR35 assessment at all. Uh, and for those which are carrying out assessments, if the assessment is inside IR35, um, they're shunting them off to, to umbrella companies or, or agencies um, rather than going through a direct engagement. And we've got an umbrella's point here on Hot Topics. Uh, over to you, Simon, to talk about this. In okay, 20 yes. Seconds. Yeah, it's just making sure umbrellas, they also have what they call a muck. So there's mucky umbrellas as well. Um, there's lots that seem to be like phoenixes, so you end up 
changing agency every couple of weeks. Uh, it's usually a scam to avoid tax and, and NI, uh, which can end up affecting the worker. But be careful because generally, if you're working for an umbrella, you're paying the employer's national insurance and your own holiday because you work. Well, they're taking that off on their fees so they can pay it for you. I think here is just do your due diligence. There are some dastardly umbrellas out there, or some very good ones, but do your due diligence. And uh, I just want to take this opportunity to thank the panel, Simon, uh, Lou, John and Samantha for joining us. Thank you to all of you for joining us as well, of course, on Payroll Question Time. Huge thank you from me and all of Mudful for myself and all the panel. We look forward to welcoming you all again to the next Payroll Question Time in October. And I will welcome you all back very, very soon. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning into the Payroll Podcast with Nick Day of JGA Recruitment. If you need help with a current payroll vacancy, then please get in touch with Nick and his team. All contact details can be found in the episode notes. In the meantime, to make sure you never miss a future episode, please subscribe to the show through any of your favorite podcast channels. Till next time.